Our first presenter is Shadia Heenan Milfarouche. She's a multidisciplinary artist working in video and performance to reconcile polarizing identities. Shadia is the recipient of the Crandall Cordero Fellowship, the Barbara Bullitt Christian Memorial Award, and is a 2020 US Fulbright semifinalist. Her work has been exhibited nationally, including in New York City, Hartford, Boston, and New Orleans. She received her BFA with a minor in psychology from the Height Art Institute at the University of Louisville and is a candidate for the MFA in studio art at the University of Connecticut. Please welcome Shadia Heenan Milfarouche. Thank you, Monica, and thank you all so much for joining us here today in this virtual space. I am excited to present in this new and unexpected way, so please sit back and enjoy. So I'll begin this presentation with where I am ending grad school with my experimental short film called Mother of the Blueness. This is an excerpt. This work interweaves performance art, film footage, and cut paper animation, positioning itself behind a veil of blue. The film is told through the perspective of Blue Betty. She is the main character, and although she is a fictional character, her story is based on my biography. She is an embodiment of my lived traumas. The 14 minute film holds within it the implications of trauma and the ways in which those implications manifest. The film is layered with imagery, narration, and sound, together housing the veins of trauma's residue, which seep into reality through obsessive compulsion, anxiety, intrusive thoughts, and sometimes fragmentation. I often think of Blue Betty as an interpretation of the Hindu goddess Kalima. Kali is the goddess of destruction, death, and time. The image on the right is the earliest version of Blue Betty when she was still in those curious stages of character development. Blue Betty is the blue mother. She is caregiver, witch, time traveler, healer. I used cut paper animation to create a portal through which Blue Betty travels in time. She travels through time searching the lines of trauma, believing, perhaps naively, that if she travels far back enough, she can change the outcome of trauma's trajectory. Her magical power is healing. She does this through the use of the evil eye, using this symbol as a mystical amulet, rich with superstition, and combines it with made up magic and ritual. The symbol is believed to ward off the evil eye, AKA jealousy, dark magic, or ill intentions. It is a symbol that has long been a part of my life, gifted as souvenirs from loved ones traveling from countries like Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, hung above the entryways in my home, dangled from the rear view mirror of every car I've ever driven, and almost always ornamentally worn around my neck. The decision to use the color blue as both the veil and the bones of this film birthed from the blue of the evil eye, but also carried with it the idea of blue as weight, using the color blue to speak to the sensory, visceral experience of trauma. 
William Gass in his book on being blue describes blue as the color of the mind in borrow of the body. It is the color consciousness becomes when it is caressed. It is the dark inside of sentences. Sentences which follow their own turnings inward, out of sight, like the whirls of a shell. Blue Betty brings to awareness the truth inside dark corners. And this film was created to caress that consciousness. In working on Mother of the Blueness, I found myself turning to my favorite filmmakers and video artists. Maya Darren, top left, made the kind of work that feels surreal and disorienting, perfectly representing how I often feel, surreal and disoriented. Sue DeBeer's work teeters the line between video art and filmmaking. I appreciate her low budget set designs, how she creates movement through color, and her abstract narratives. Her film Blue Lenses was actually the catalyst for how I wanted my film to feel, something slow and enticing like a lullaby or perhaps even a scary story. Films like Holy Mountain by Alejandro Jodorowsky and Color of Pomegranates by Sergei Parajanov both have a similar rawness to their aesthetic. And what I love most about these films are their raunchiness, the boldness, and their unapologetic absurdism. As an artist, I began by way of photography as a means of documenting the world around me to then study and try to better understand that world. Eventually, I had turned the camera on myself and began making self-portraits. It was really myself I wanted to understand, or more so myself in relation to the world around me. In doing so, I realized I was performing for the camera, so naturally I moved into working with video and performance. As I began to develop a performance and video practice, I found the need to bring in materials with intention. Moving away from mere documentation and self-portraiture into something more premeditated. I turned to materials that were already part of my world, including textiles like shalvar kameez and hijabs, food like pomegranates, roti, tea, and coffee. I made numerous attempts to activate these objects. I peeled, beat, broke, smeared, stitched, suspended, and reconfigured. In regarding the pain of others, Susan Sontag wrote, all memory is individual, irreproducible. It dies with each person. What is called collective memory is not a remembering, but a stipulating that this is important and this is the story about how it happened with the pictures that lock the story in our minds. And so I found myself sitting with my old photos, thinking about the stories locked in my mind. Introspection has always been a quiet pest, whispering me to move inward, to understand the confusion and reconcile the dissonance. It occurs as an urgency that feels like loss, like all the times you think you're forgetting something, but you can't quite remember what. I am compelled to remember. And in pursuit of memory, I look to my archives. Though when I return to my childhood photos and the collective memory of my family, I am mostly met with wet-eyed nostalgia, not in the warm and fuzzy longing for yesterday sense, but in the sense of shared pain, it is felt. This is a photograph from Eid 1999. For me, it evokes the smell of sesame halva flowering from the kitchen. The memory of my mother with pale freckled skin and a subtle but sometimes noticeable Southern accent. And my abu, Urdu for father, though in my case, stepfather. My childhood involved Arabic lessons at the masjid, Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina, Bollywood films, and eavesdropping on conversations in Urdu. All of this set against a Houston, Texas backdrop, a stint in Girl Scouts, sticky summers in Kentucky, and an identity crisis. It is a pickle and a cucumber.
In addition to the archive of images and family footage, I've held on to Qurans, letters, Sunday school books, passports, and a teacup or two. These objects exist as artifacts from a past life that at times feels like it was never really mine. I make work to remember what I know I am forgetting. My Urdu has faded, Farsi leaves me tangled, and English always feels like chalk in my mouth. I am aggressive with my words. When I first decided to pursue art making, which did not come naturally nor without hesitation, I looked to artists like Shireen Nishat and Sarah Maple, two wildly different artists, both in approach and style, but each in their own fearlessness assisted me in a way that felt like being granted permission, permission to make art. Growing up as Muslim, other outsider, art really never felt like the path one would choose to blend in or to be silent, rather quite the opposite. Art makes a point, it takes a stance. My search as an artist has been to examine the multitude of ways in which our identities are shaped, how we perceive them, how we construct them, and how we perform them. I am fascinated by how we name ourselves, like the names we call home, in an effort to construct our origin stories or to make meaning in our lives. My fascination tiptoes the line between general inquiry and obsession as it moves from curiosity into a deep-seated hunger for understanding. I want to know what it means to be a body and a mind. And the infamous studio shot. I really only included this image because most people have experienced my studio as neat, organized, and seemingly put together. But hey, sometimes, just sometimes, it gets about this messy. Regarding my approach to artistic practice, I can't say there's really a strict methodology. Some of my works generate after brainstorming ideas and sketching prototypes. While some happen more spontaneously, some through chance and others just through happy accidents. In this work, I listened to an audio recording of my grandmother with her thick Southern accent telling a story of violence as I dipped cast iron skillets in ink and slammed them repeatedly against the wall. In the process, I cut my knuckles and broke the handle. The performance was the slamming, while the marks left on Arch's paper served as residue of rage, art incited by action. Sometimes my approach is through technical process. Here I use the photographic process of cyanotype, interested in the indigo color, thinking of my Iranian ancestors who were indigo farmers. I imagine their hands, their skin, I think about how they may have drank their tea and shared songs and poetry in the summer shade. With those thoughts, I trace these Islamic art patterns with turmeric yellow thread as a performative attempt to trace my lineage. Though, as you can see, the results are sloppy and tangled. With Mother of the Blueness, the process involved a lot of planning and thinking. This was possibly the most structured process of my practice thus far. I spent a great deal of time fleshing out the character, the mission, story structure, flow, thinking about how I wanted the film to feel, what, it wanted, what I wanted it to look like. In this untitled work, I placed Persian teacups across an American shelf collected from the trash, painted it white with a red underbelly, and left teacups filled with black tea for one month, allowing the liquid to evaporate and encrust the insides. What I did not anticipate in this process was the development of mold, though truthfully I was really quite pleased as the mold so delicately yet bluntly occupied its new home, bursting into eruptive shapes. It is this idea of shape-shifting and emergence from one thing into something else that excites me. Moving further into the archives to understand the origins of my shape and how to burst from the mold, I looked to my father. I began with photographs both created and found, letters and audio recordings, 
all as a means of study from which to abstract. Again, these materials serve as conduits for deeper understandings and future works. My series, Rosewater for Juma, documents sacred objects, including tasbi, a torba, which is used during salat to symbolize earth, and sometimes family heirlooms, or fragrances such as frankincense and myrrh. Each object is bundled together, wrapped with care, and contained within the prayer rugs. When praying, one opens the bundle and places each revered relic at the head of their prayer, prayer rug, as if on an altar, bowing to with each prostration. This work really started to support my inquiries into evocative objects and the power they hold, as well as understanding the significance of symbolism. Tea Time with Baba is an eight and a half performance for video, which considers the impermanence of tangible moments and the ungraspable disappearance of all things. The screen on the left suggests the presence of my father, though he is not physically there. My experience here is twofold, in that I want more from this relationship with my father, yet in the very same breath, I am aware of the tug on our connection due to missing time and distance. With the intricate audio and the slow meditative peeling of clementines, I invite viewers to sit down, to sit down with me, to listen, to notice, to pay attention. To shift my attention to my maternal lineage, I began with research. Aside from my maternal grandmother, Martha Frances Jetter, I have neither held nor maintained much connection to my mother's side. The family history I have is mostly absorbed through passing stories from my grandmother, which often become distorted the more times they're repeated, and the little bits and pieces my mother offers. I sold my soul and used public databases and DNA testing to search for historical documentation of my mother's ancestry. I was able to trace immigration records for ancestors from England, Wales, and France, a great grandfather from New Mexico, and a lot of ancestors in the American South. Though what I was most interested in was my great-great-grandmother, Alva May Pike. She was born in Pine Hill, Kentucky on August 27, 1895 the daughter of Jacob and Jenny Shaw Pike. She lived on South 6th Street in Louisville, Kentucky and worked as a bookkeeper. Alva Mae Pike was murdered on March 15, 1918, killed by a stab wound to the heart by her ex-lover. In thinking about this discovery, the stories of my mother and grandmother and my own life experiences, I began digging into the theory of intergenerational transmission of trauma. This is the idea that trauma experienced in one's life is embedded in the DNA, that it rewrites the genetic code and passes down the bloodline. When I look at my grandmother, I see the impact of her burdens across the lines in her face. The grooves in her forehead are deep and reveal strengths I have had to know, that my mother has had to know, and that all the women in me know. Ancestral cleanup allowed me through performance and installation to consider this transmission of trauma. The process involved spilt black coffee to symbolize the blood of my maternal lineage, dripped and leaking on a white table. The action lies in the repetitive attempt to clean up and wipe away the spillage using an antique children's garment. The gown starts out clean and unsuspecting, but eventually becomes drenched in the inevitable stain of personal and inherited traumas. Trauma reshapes the brain, reconfiguring the perception of identity both in the survivor and the witness. Trauma stores itself in the tissue, in the muscle, in the body of the survivor. I often wonder who I might be without my trauma, though conversely, who would my trauma be without me? As I explored my lineage, tracing paths home through my mother and father, I, need, I knew I needed to amalgamate. 
Chant to Save is a performance revealing mirrored selves made opposite by independent rituals. To construct a corporeal experience of blending and blurring, I merge the physical sequence of the Islamic prayer with the classical sun salutation sequence of yoga, layered beneath the recitation of the Gayatri mantra and the call to prayer. The audio sources become inseparable and the movements become ceremonial, almost like a call to something, like a search for devotion. The similarities between recitation and movement become the observable channel towards amalgamation. Mahlut, which is a Farsi word for blending or to blend, represents the blending of my two bloodlines through the literal blending of fabrics indicative of each. The photographs position the viewer behind the head as an outsider looking in to encourage viewers to reconcile multiple identities, experiencing themselves as outsiders. Mahluth reveals what it means to exist in between two spaces. It realizes the inevitable emergence of a third self. To induce the birthing of this third self, I pulled from my archives and used textiles to explore themes of repetition, movement, and layering. Moving under the current of silent waves is a performance in which I layer one by one scarves from each identity over my body. When the final scarf is layered, my physical body figuratively descends, dies, and becomes undone. After a pause, I embrace the birth of a new being, swaying and moving under the no longer heavy, but now integrated layering of bloodlines. The result is evolution of a new being, creature, race, or some other unnameable entity. Because once you name something, it becomes something else. <laughs> 